Start the symphony, we'll get going. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all so much for attending our community safety focused town hall. I want to first um, begin the conversation with gratitude uh, in thanking our wonderful facilitator Poonam, uh, who has been doing a great job and we uh, first met um, during another facilitated process uh, here in the city of Tucson and we've been lucky to have her help us um, have these community engagement uh, processes that are so important um, for mayor and council and our city manager and our department directors to hear. And then much love and gratitude uh, to our city manager, Michael Ortega, who's here with us today, as well as the department directors that are participating in this um, really necessary uh, conversation with a community. Um, I, we started last year with uh, wanting to start community dialogues, listening sessions, and want to make sure that we hear from the community as to what we all feel is important. So the departments that are here with us today that comprise, uh, the thought was that we wanted to have budget town halls, not focused on departments, but focused on services. And today's town hall is um, community safety, focused on community safety and the departments that serve our community to keep it safe. And that includes uh, Tucson Police Department, Fire Department, our 911 Communications Department, Housing Department, and our, um, our courts. I don't know if I'm missing anyone else, our Housing Community Development Department. All of these departments serve our community and focus uh, their services on, on community safety and public safety. So to the department directors that are joining us, you'll hear from each of them today and their teams. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for spending time to prepare for this. And uh, to my staff, because my staff, uh, starting with my chief of staff, Charlene Mendoza, uh, Hennessy Scubias, uh, Nate Siegel, Fatima Luna, um, our newest member, Manisha Dutra, Juan, as all of them have really worked hard to make sure that you are all aware that we're having these budget town halls. So what is community safety? Uh, we want to hear from you. We have the departments that provide the services to our residents here. They will talk to you about the services they deliver and how we work together to provide community safety. But we want to hear from you what you feel uh, community safety is and uh, what programs and departments we need to make sure that we are uh, funding and um, what programs we need to create if we don't have them, or asking questions as simple as asking questions to ask our department directors and our staff here what we uh, what we provide, what services we fund um, are all important. So I'd like to um, give the space and the and the microphone to uh, Poonam that she will lead us through this conversation. Uh, but I really do want all of us to think holistically what community safety means to all of us and uh, for you all to give us your input, give us your advice, give us your feedback. Thank you all for being here on a beautiful sunny day in Tucson, Arizona. Um, we have about 134 attendees, which means that 134 of you are super interested in this conversation and wanna give us your feedback and input. Thank you all. And uh, Poonam, it's all yours. Mayor Romero, thank you. You inspire me every time I listen to you um, to be a better citizen and a better resident. So welcome everybody. 90 minutes on a Saturday with all kinds of competing and priorities not lost on any of us how big a deal that is. So big thanks. Um, let me just quickly bullet a couple of things. The why we're here. Mayor Romero just set a wonderful and elegant table for us. It is all around the budgeting process that is currently underway by late spring the mayor and council will receive a recommended budget for approval going forward. Um, and there is a desire, the intention of the mayor, the council and the leadership 
at your city is to migrate over time into a budget that is built reflecting your priority priority around services. So in order to have those conversations, it is a, the desire is to move towards a participatory budgeting process. It's, it's a profound yet simple shift. It ain't gonna happen in one 90 minute Zoom call. So I just wanna level set expectations. This, look at this like this is one really awesome and significant step in moving in that direction. Um, I just wanna quickly talk about budgeting just for a minute. In my own life, I am never able to afford all that I want. And so I go through some pretty sophisticated trade-off considerations in my own mind so that I can ultimately have something that makes sense for my life that I can afford. When it comes to our community, if we want more or better services for the community than we can currently afford, then we can choose to pay a little more to be able to afford them. Those are decisions that collectively we need to make. And that's the desire is to get your contribution and put into that. Bottom line, city budgets are simply big versions of what we do in our own lives. So please bring your life experience and your budgeting expertise into this discussion as well. So that's the why. Mayor Council, city leadership want this budget process to become more participatory. Three goals for today. One is to hear you, your ideas, your perspectives, your priorities, your thoughts. It all matters. That's We've got a whole bunch of city leaders and staff with both ears wide open on receptor mode. They're listening like crazy. Second, we want to learn. It matters that we sort of level set a shared understanding of what the various services even are so that we're talking about the same things. So we will do that. And then third, it is to advance equity. Your mayor, your council, your entire leadership team are deeply committed to advance to advancing equity in everything that the city does, including the budgeting process. I'm gonna take a quick sidebar here. Um, and I wanna just show you, I just wanna level set what we, uh, I wanna make sure that we're all talking about it the same way. So there is often uh, confusion or conflation between what I'm gonna call equality. Can you see my screen? You see a little picture with a bunch of little bikes? Great. Here's equality. Equality means I have one thing and I give the same thing to every person. Left to right, does it work for that uniquely abled person on the far left? No, but I'm engaged in equality. Does it work for the very tall person? Nope, but I'm engaged in equality. It works for the one, that's the third one over, and it doesn't work for that little itty bitty person. So equality is this notion of, I give the same thing to everybody. Um, equity is the next Let's look at what that means. Equity, here's what it is. It means I give the bike you need. Simple thing, right? So as we think about city services, equity is the pursuit. Are we delivering services in a way that honors and meets the needs of all of us in Tucson? Uh, here's another way to look at it. Um, there we go. A different way to look at it. Far left, equality. Everyone gets the same box to overcome the barrier, that is to be able to see the game. Second one, equity. I give people the number of boxes they need to be able to benefit from watching the game. Over on the right, that should be our aspiration as every community, and that's to get to a place of justice where we've actually dis, sort of disassembled the fundamental thing that gets in our way, right? And that's justice so that we can uh, not have inequity in the first place. So as we talk about equity, think about it. As we think of it, as you hear about the city services, are there services that can be made more equitable in their delivery or their impact? Um, so that is it. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. I'm not going to ask multi so I have to say out loud what I'm doing or I'll confuse myself. Um, I'm going to make Lane the host. Lane, where are you? This is me talking out loud, so I'm going to multi Mayor, the room, sorry, Lane, the room that you're in is which one? Thank you, Poonam. I should be, I should be. Up have you gained the now. controls? You got them? Okay. So there are three goals for the today. One, to hear from you. Two, for all of us to learn a little. Three, to advance equity through the budgeting process. Now let's quickly turn to the how we're gonna do this. Um, as the mayor mentioned so well, community safety is the focus area of this discussion. You're gonna hear from city leaders on six topics, all really important to community safety. So we've got a common understanding of those services. Then we're gonna ask you to prioritize the importance of the various services that you've heard about. And then finally, we're gonna have a conversation, open discussion. So before we begin, we just wanna test drive our technology. So here's what I want you to do. 
um, please pull out either your phones or open another window in your browser and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Do you want to bring that up, Charlene Lane? I need to hear it. Come on, Lane is not the host again yet, so if you could please double check that. So where, which room is she in? Because is, is she identified as Lane? Yes. Okay, turn. Turn right. Lane, just say something so I can find. Phenom? Just say something. Just keep talking to me. There you are. There you are. Yes. So I'm going to come to you. The one thing about a video chat with hundreds of people is uh, that there are hundreds of people. All right, Lane, you are now the host. We're bringing up the instruction. I wanted to see um, technology. The, um, uh, I have to be Lane, there for can the we mute? If you are not, just ensure, please, that you're on mute right. so that we're picking up background noise. Um, Sherry, the answer is you don't need another laptop, but you do need another way to access the internet. could be on the same thing you're on right now. Just open a new window in your browser. And the website is menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And when you go there, it'll ask you to insert a code it's an eight digit code and you'll see it at the top of the screen, 7393-2599. The question that comes up is the one you're looking at. In a single word, please answer the question, what does community safety mean to you? In a single word, what does community safety mean to you? We are now seeing a word cloud before our very eyes as you submit your answer. The words will come up and the more frequently they are mentioned, the bigger they'll, they'll appear. Good, so almost 40 of us have responded. Keep responding. We'll give you a moment to do that. Dr. Mendoza, you were right. This is a really cool feature. <laughs> Good, we've got over 80 of you responding so far. It's wonderful. Keep going. Over 100. Over 130. Great. That's great. I mean, we can see that based on the size of the word, right? So as a community, those of us that are here today, our sensibility collectively is community safety is about police uh, safety, I'm not sure how to interpret defund or abolition, um, peace, protection, fire, security. That's great. Well, that was impressive. We've got over 230, 40 responses and only 150 people participating. So um, I think we got people that are double and triple dipping. Thanks. Um, all right, let's keep going. Keep, please keep Menti open because you will need it later. So that was just a test drive. We now know it works. So let's go. So the six topics, the mayor listed them off relative to community safety. Here they are, housing, courts, 911 communications, and community safety pilot program. So our first topic, housing, will be addressed by Liz Morales, who is director of housing and community development. She will make a presentation and then relay through the other five presenters. And so sit back and enjoy. Take it, Liz. Thank you, Poonam. And hello, everyone. Very nice to be part of this group. Uh, housing community development uh, would, is part of community safety because we are uh, an agency uh, department that really looks at that safety net aspect of, of our community. Um, you know, we focus on the needs of the, of the people, our community, and housing for our city. 
Many uh, would consider us as social services for the city, but we are one of many partners that serve those who are vulnerable and are low income. I will share a quick overview of some of the work that is done through our department. First, I wanna to speak to the housing that is available. Uh, HCD is short for Housing Community Development, serves as the public housing authority for the city of Tucson. We own and operate over 1,500 units of public housing, which is sub subsidized by the Federal Department of HUD. We also operate Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. It is, uh, we have over 5,500 vouchers for both the city of Tucson and Pima County. And the voucher program is a national program in which the participants receive a housing subsidy based on their income. Uh, HCD, we pay the landlord a portion of the rent and the tenant pays approximately 30% of their income at, for rent and utilities. They can also take their voucher uh, anywhere uh, it's portable, it's mobile, so they can take it if they want to live in one unit in Tucson and maybe want to move over to another part of town to be closer to the family, or they can even move outside of Tucson or uh, to another state um, or and community. We also are landlords to over 400 units that are affordable, which means the rents are below the average market rents. HCD also receives other federal grants. Some of them are more, are more well known, and this is the next slide. Um, one is Community Development Block Grant, which is also called CDBG and Home Investment Grant. The CDBG grant can fund many things. Uh, the way we have used it in Tucson is to fund projects like at parks, uh, streets park projects, like we, we just finished funding uh, South 12th Avenue improvements. And we also revitalize neighborhoods. Some of the programs we do it, that's really important is help uh, do home repair for low-income homeowners. Um, the home program is targeted for developing affordable housing. It has gone for both rental dev development, but we also help with home ownership. So we will do down payment assistance uh, for low income uh, families. HCD is uh, through our federal funding and also the city's general funds uh, fund a variety of programs to our nonprofit community agencies. To give you an idea, this funding has been used to support anti-poverty measure uh, programs, food assistance uh, programs and services for homelessness and transportation. Many of those who benefit from these programs are youth, older adults, persons experiencing homelessness, survivors of domestic violence, and persons with disabilities, just to name some. I wanna share on the next slide, some of the successes that HCD um, has been able to uh, lead for the for the community. Last year, uh, when we realized that COVID-19 virus was a serious and contagious virus, we heard from our community shelter providers their concerns about the congregate shelters and the people that were living in them, and also for those living on the streets and how they might be exposed to the virus. The city took uh, the proactive action to rent hotels, and the key objective once they were um, housed in, in these hotels was to connect them to um, housing. We had, we served individuals um, and families. We just asked that they meet uh, the high risk uh, categories of age, underlying conditions, those type of things. We also placed uh, those who are COVID positive into a separate uh, hotel to help them through their recovery. Um, the model on the next slide uh, is housing first. And Housing First is a, a national best practice. Um, those placed in housing have no conditions for entry and receive wraparound services that are tailored and wanted by those being served. This is one individual, Nagasi, who shared that after being homeless for more than two years and was placed in one of our hotels, he now has a Section 8 voucher. And because of this, he can address his medical needs and his health is now his focus instead of trying to survive uh, on the streets. HCD employs three homeless outreach workers who go out daily uh, on a daily basis to engage and connect with those who are on the streets and are unsheltered. This work is important because it takes often many uh, connections, much engagement before someone accepts help. And so it's not enough just to ask them once, we ask them multiple times and see how we can help them. And our, our outreach workers have been very successful, not just in engaging and connecting, but to getting them connected to housing, as you can see in those numbers. 
We also recognize that during the months of extreme temperatures and weather, it, that places a, a lot of people at high risk on the streets. And so um, here, uh, what we did is we partnered with the Salvation Army this past summer and they to provide respite and, and shelter out uh, during the day. Uh, they would provide water, um, sanitation uh, products, and, and also food. Um, it was a place for them to get some rest out of the heat. We also, for the winter months, provided over 4,000 blankets and sleeping bags to help protect them during the night temperatures. One of the services that HCD oversees is called Homeless Protocol. It is a citywide program. We work with the departments that uh, like environmental services and streets um, and parks and recreation. And what we do is we receive the calls or emails from our community residents when there are homeless camps that pose a threat to public safety or they see criminal activity in public spaces like the city parks or other public areas. On this slide, I do want to point that we do have the email on here, homelessprotocol at tucsonaz.gov, or you can call 520-837-5342 if you do see an encampment that is problematic or concerning, um, and you can get that information to us. And we not only go and do outreach and try to connect them to housing and services, we also will give them notice that we're going to need to come in and clean up that area. So that's what we do with homeless protocol. I want to leave with a uh, final uh, information on something that's really important right now. I'm sure you've all heard about the eviction moratorium with COVID-19. A lot of people were impacted financially and, uh, and we know there's a lot that are either on the brink or or will be evicted um, once the moratorium is lifted. Um, we are fortunate to receive over 17 million um, from the US Department of Treasury. This is actually the second round. This, the mayor and council provide us funding in the first round out of the mayor, uh, the cit uh, city's funds for community uh, coronavirus relief funds. This is a second round. Um, this can provide up to 12 months of, of arrears and three months going forward for families that were affected by COVID and need rental or utility assistance. And the way to get there is to go to uh, the Community Investment Corporation is our application portal and administrator for this program for both the city of Tucson and Pima County. You, and if you know someone who needs that assistance, they can go to tucsonep.com for assistance. And, um, and if not, you can go to our website and there's information there as well, how to get to that, to that, those um, funds and get that assistance. So thank you for your time again. And I'm going to introduce um, my friend and city's, the city's public defender, Mary Trejo, who will speak on the courts. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Liz. I just wanna start by sharing portions of an email I recently received. Thank you for all the helpful assistance you provided my son in his most trying journey upon losing his son, my grandson. Please thank the judge for me as well. I was most appreciative for her understanding of situations experienced by all who come into her courtroom, including my son. To have people like you and the judge giving hope was a great blessing. My son has since been closer to how he was before the incident, though he continues to, lose, to miss his son very much. This client successfully completed one of our mental health diversion programs. As you can tell, these programs make a difference and touch the lives of our clients, their families, friends, and our community. I am Mary Trejo and I am the Chief um, Public Defender for the City of Tucson. And I am excited to share information about programs that we offer in the courthouse that you may or may not know about. Let's face it, when most people come to city court, they are dealing with some type of a crisis. So it's our responsibility to help them with the process. Not only do we help people with their criminal charges, but we also take a holistic approach to helping our clients by addressing underlying issues such as mental health, drug and alcohol addiction, family situations, and or homelessness. We are fortunate to have specialty courts to help, help us address these issues. Mental health court was created because our mentally ill clients were not being treated appropriately in the criminal justice system. We had a revolving door and it was frustrating for our clients and for us because we were not giving them the appropriate tools to succeed. Mental health court was a way to connect our clients with services and hold them accountable for their actions 
while imposing sanctions that encourage treatment. A unique feature of this program is that our community mental health providers from La Frontera, COPE, Kodak are present in court and help our clients. Domestic Violence Court was created to provide victims of domestic violence greater access to the court system and to provide them with services. We have victim advocates in court to provide information on orders of protection, shelters, and other needed services. We also have a veterans court and evidence shows when veterans return from war, they suffer severe problems adjusting to civilian life. Some problems include mental illness and homelessness. This program is very similar to mental health court. However, the provider is the Veterans Affair. We found that veterans relate better to other veterans who understand the trauma they have suffered. So the judge and the providers are veterans themselves. So we can move to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. Homeless court is currently designed to assist those who, have, who are in residential treatment for at least 45 days and they have a caseworker. The program helps to resolve their legal matters that have created barriers for housing, employment, and even their driver's license. Our newest specialty court is Compass Court, which stands for, uh, let me try this, Consolidated Misdemeanor Problem Solving Court. <laughs> the, the key to this program is intervention. The whole idea is to help our clients stay on track with treatment, stop the escalating behavior, and stop the cycle. We take a holistic approach to this program as well. A unique feature of this program is that we ask our clients what they need rather than us telling them what they need. As we look to the future, we have an opportunity to start a new problem solving court called Community Court. This would allow us to reach members of our community and to work with that population that doesn't qualify for any of the programs I just mentioned. A community court would combine accountability and offer support on needed services. Transportation is frequently an issue for a lot of people. So wouldn't it be great if we could take our court to different offsite locations? And what if we add mentors and social workers and housing navigators? The first step, step we need to do to get this program started is we need to find out, we need to do an assessment and find out who our target audience is. What are the needs we are trying to address? And we need to make sure that we're not duplicating efforts or, or um, our resources. The limits of this program lie solely in our imaginations and it can be whatever we want it to be. So I hope I've, I've shared an insight on how the court system has adapted and modified the way we work with our community members and our clients. So I'd like to pass the torch to um, Fire Chief Ch Chuck Ryan. Hey, good morning, everyone. Madam Mayor, thanks for the opportunity, folks. Thanks for being here this morning uh, on a Saturday and spending some time with us. I wanna take a few minutes and talk to you about um, your Tucson Fire Department. The metrics are there for you to see. Uh, we have an authorized headcount of 632 sworn personnel uh, we're currently operating with about 30 vacancies, but we do have a recruit class in session right now, and they'll graduate sometime in uh, early June. We have a very dedicated civilian force of 56 employees helping us out, and we serve the city across 22 fire stations uh, spread throughout the city, strategically located. The data shows um, our, our call volume is not decreasing, it's increasing, right? Even in the year of the pandemic, our call volume went up. What's not reflected here is that almost 90% now of our calls here in the city of Tucson are EMS or emergency medical services related calls. And you can see from the photos uh, around the frame there that we are, we are far more than just a uh, fire response or medical response agency. Uh, some of the things you see depicted there, um, a hiker rescue being executed by members of our technical rescue team. Uh, you see a pet being helped by some of our paramedics on a fire scene. The picture in the below center, our hazardous materials response unit, which runs Seattle Fire Central here downtown, which supports not just the city of Tucson, but all of Southern Arizona. And really importantly, I wanna point out to you what that ISO class one logo means uh, for this city. Um, that is the insurance service organization and they provide insurance ratings for municipalities. And to have a class one rating is the number one rating a city can have. And what that translates to for you as residents, property owners, business owners here in Tucson is lower insurance rates 
for your hazard premiums. That because that um, certification was conferred upon Tucson Fire in 2017. Uh, the ISO at about five year cycles reviews uh, a fire department and a municipality's performance in order to maintain that rating. In order to do that, uh, a lot of metrics go into the algorithm that the ISO uses to figure that out, but response times and fire staffing is a big piece of it. So we need to really work to maintain pace and keep our class one ISO rating in this city. And I really wanna focus also on the last bullet on this slide before moving on, what life years added means. That means our firefighters and paramedics encountered people in cardiac arrest, revived them, got a re what we call a ROSC or re return of spontaneous circulation, transported them to the hospital, and then those patients then walked out of the hospital days later on their own power. And that returned in 2020 alone, 1,054 years to this community. Next slide, please. So we are really, uh, like I said, more than just a response agency, we're a community risk reduction agency. By city charter, we have the legal authority and obligation to manage emergency management for the city of Tucson, as we've been doing with the city's pandemic response plan in coordination with all of the other city departments. Our TC3 program has, has really kind of morphed. It started as a program to help reduce the number of calls caused by high utilizers of the 911 system for non-emergent needs. Um, and connecting them with uh, a framework of services and helping them prevent falling through the cracks. And now it's morphed into even more, working with the police homeless outreach team, working with housing, working with the parks and rec to get out into the community get, to engage with our uh, most underserved members of the community and most vulnerable. We've delivered over 50,000 vaccines at the Tucson Convention Center Vaccine Clinic to help combat COVID-19. Our life safety educators work really hard in this circle of life programs, meaning youth services to senior services to help educate on life safety, fire safety. Our building review, plans review, building inspectors, uh, both civilian and commission are out there assuring life safety in the structures that you visit and live in here in the city. And we like to engage in outreach with our entire community. And you can see some of the photos there, uh, reading in schools, delivering fire safety education programs. So long and short is public safety is a very expensive entity for any city and we know that but our mission is obviously to serve you in the most effective and efficient way possible and to protect our class one ISO rating as a city. Next slide, please. So I wanna close on a high note. I really encourage you to follow us on our social media platforms. We're on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, our public information officer does an outstanding job. Our people su supply great information and you can find a lot of fun tips on there, find out news about breaking incidents and learn more about fire and life safety in your city. And I want to close with the slide on the right there, the picture on the right. Bear down, let's go, Lady Cats. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to our police chief, Chris Magnus, and his team. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Chief Ryan. We're certainly fortunate to have such a great fire department in the city, and we work closely together. Um, I'm joined this morning here, and by the way, we're all vaccinated, so that's why we're not wearing our masks, but I've got uh, Deputy Chief Eric Kazmierzak, Assistant Chief John Strader, and Assistant Chief Mike Silva with me here at the table this morning. Now, I know there's so many things that the police department is involved in, we could never even hope to cover them all in the detail they deserve, but I want to focus in on one of them that a lot of people don't know that much about, even though they may see things on TV that they think sound right, but we want to put some things in perspective a little bit. So let's go to um, the next slide, please. We really want to um, look at homicide from the standpoint of uh, an, equity, an equity lens. Um, this is really one of the challenges that we, we need to deal with in our community. Next slide, please. We're one of only one of many major cities around the country that's experienced a pretty significant rise in the number of homicides since 2019. But in Tucson, it, it has really been a problem. It's up 66%, so that's very significant. And non-fatal shootings are also up. It's important to understand that really the only difference between a non-fatal and a fatal shooting is often, uh, it's often just a matter of centimeters. And, and how fortunate a victim is to get into surgery right away. Next slide. 
Now, research has shown there are many factors that contribute to the number of homicides and the amount of violent crime in a city. And so we'd be the first to agree at addressing these problems can't just be left to the police. These are community problems and they have to be dealt with as such. But sadly, homicide impacts racial and ethnic groups disproportionately. And in our city, 18% of homicide victims are black, yet they make up only 5% of the population. And that disproportionality is actually much, much greater for Native Americans. Next slide. So, so let's take a quick look at how homicides in Tucson are often linked to specific locations. I'm gonna just go over a, a really fast case study of this, which is in the area around 1440 South Craycroft, which is the Knights Inn. Now, check out these, I think these are pretty shocking numbers. 11 homicides in five years, 29 non-fatal shootings, and 130 calls for the police last year. There have already been 25 calls this year. And here's the thing, violent crime spreads like an infectious disease. So it's not just the hotel, it's the area around it that has high crime numbers. And we have, by the way, other, other spots in the city that are not dissimilar to this. Next slide. So to address a complex problem like homicide, here's the thing, it takes technical and adaptive solutions. Now, technical approaches include the best application of things we already know that work. And the police do play a, a primary role in utilizing these approaches. Now, we're fortunate that we have some of the best detectives in the country, and we provide them with some of the best possible training, as well as other key resources that, are inc that include really our incredible crime lab, which, by the way, you can tour. Um, it is a phenomenal lab and the people that work there are, are some of the best scientists and, and folks around. And as a result, our people are so good, they solve 80% of our homicides compared to a 60% or less solve rate in most other large cities. We're also using better data thanks to our analysis division. That's the division that Mike um, and his crew run. And we've transitioned many more of our patrol personnel to focus on violent crimes. Next slide. Now, adaptive solutions, as compared to technical ones, involve new ways of looking at problems, out-of-the-box thinking, and here's the thing, even more engagement with others outside of the police department. And so one example of this is a new initiative that we're implementing along with six other major cities, and it's called Place Network Investigations, or PNI. PNI is, is based on the idea that there's an important link between people and their environment. And another important component of PNI is that shooters are often part of a network that, when, when identified, can be disrupted. So we're working with a, a very well-known criminal justice researcher. Her name is Dr. Robin Engel, who's been very successful in helping Cincinnati and other cities use PNI to reduce homicides. Now, very quickly, another important adaptive strategy is this thing called the Pareto Principle. And it's important because what it says is that 20% of the offenders commit 80% of the most serious crimes. So using tools like social network analysis can help us focus our intervention, and this is where the community comes in, intervention and enforcement efforts on this 20%. And when we do that, we also reduce dispro disproportionate minority contacts known as DMC involving the police. Finally, but very importantly, we're using a new approach to deal with not only crime, but also with quality of life issues. It's called ComStat 360, and it involves teams of personnel throughout the department taking on specific problems, like what's going on around the Knights Inn, and focusing intensively on these problems using data, coordinated strategies, multiple research and evalu evaluation tools, and also involving the community. Very important. Next slide. So I'd like to sort of wrap this up by understanding what it takes to solve and equally important to prevent homicides. Homicides are largely, I mean, they're large intensive activities and they easily take over 500 personnel 
hours in most cases. And that's a lot of time. They also require adequate staffing. You gotta have that staffing to manage the crime scene. You gotta have it to handle all the other calls for service when so many patrol officers have to be utilized on a homicide call. Remember, homicide calls can involve 20 plus officers out of the scene. So you still have to have other people to handle the calls for service out in the community. And I think perhaps most importantly, we need to be out in the community building relationships and trust because we can't solve homicides or any other violent crime without the help of community members. Now, here's the challenge. TPD staffing level is at its lowest point in the past 30 years, and it continues to decline even as Tucson's population increases. We're now down to a sworn staffing level in the upper, set, in the upper 700s. And our people, well, they can only be stretched so thin. Next slide. Preventing homicides, once again, highlights the need to have enough department members and community partners to do the things we already know that work, plus these various new adaptive approaches that we're taking on. For example, deflecting individuals with substance abuse or mental health problems into treatment, rather than arresting them for drug possession or a number of other minor crimes that are linked to their situation, is key if we're going to keep their criminal behavior from escalating. No one gets treatment in jail. So our goal has to be to keep as many people out of jail as possible. Our mental health support team, also known as MIST, works with community and mental health partners to engage proactively with individuals identified as a high risk for future violence. Again, with the form of treatment has to, you know, is the right kind of intervention here. It's got to be treatment rather than jail to get people the help they need. We're committed to working closely with Mayor Romero's Gun Safety Task Force. This is a new process that's starting up. I think we offer key information and value to that group, and we want to be a good partner there. We're also continuing to partner with ASU, I know I said it, ASU, on their Thrive in the O5 initiative which has been shown to reduce crime in that whole section of town. And a final key point, look, whether it's our PNI or CompStat 360 projects or any of these other things we've talked about relative to homicide, really it applies across the board. None of these things work without the support of our other city departments, which I'm happy to say we're getting, our community service providers who are very invested in and perhaps most importantly, and that's why it's so great being able to talk to you all this morning, our Tucson residents. So happy to provide information on any uh, of the other projects we're working on, as well as obviously this initiative around homicides. And again, appreciate the opportunity to present to you this morning. And so I am going to hand it off to one of our key partners in public safety. Uh, couldn't do anything without the communications center that brings us the calls and Chad Kasmar is the director. Chad, it's off to you. Thank you, Chief Magnus. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for spending some of your Saturday with us so uh, we can talk a little about of what we do and the services that we provide to our communities. So again, my name is Chad Kasmar. I am the Interim Public Safety Communications Department Director. That's a mouthful. And what do we do? We connect you with the right resources that you need when you're in crisis. And so we have an authorized strength of 165 personnel. Uh, we are currently holding uh, 50 vacancies and we have some challenges around that as uh, that have been very public and, and, uh, and the city has been very clear of their commitment to really um, double down and commit to this consolidation effort and get us uh, to where we need to be. So why has that been a challenge? Well, in 2017, uh, the city of Tucson Mayor Council committed to police department and the fire department committed to a consolidated communications department. And the goal of that would be more efficient uh, uh, use of city resources, but a better delivery of services when you called 911 and you were in crisis. Uh, we're well underway on that project, but we still have a lot of work to do. With a small but mighty uh, workforce that reflects 69% uh, uh, females holding those leadership positions. We have 100 deployable personnel. So what does that mean to you as a community? 
It means sometimes we challenge, we have challenges of getting to those calls. Uh, we'll talk a little bit on the next slide about uh, the goals and expectations that we set for that. In the scheme of the public safety budgets, we are uh, quite a bit smaller than uh, both police and fire, but the workload is immense. We manage over 4,000 calls a day that come into our emergency communication center. About 1,500 of those are emergency calls per service, and the other, other calls per service can either be coming from local nearby uh, uh, dispatch centers or, or calls that come into our 911 operations that are not emergency calls for service. Happy to report that our consolidated home uh, will be completed this year, uh, which the staff is extremely excited to move into. So lives saved, what do we do down here? So when you call 911, um, the tip of the spear of public safety is the 911 uh, piece at what we call specialist one of getting you to the right resource. Now we traditionally think about those resources being either a firefighter or a police officer, but what we now know is in, in the shifting expectations of our community is that you might need to be connected to a mental health service provider, or maybe it's just not the appropriate call to come into the 911. So when we talk about our budget, we're talking about shifting expectations. Um, next slide, please. Of, of putting the right work in the right hands. Uh, when we look back at last summer in our local community event of, of talking about the Carlos Ingram Lopez case, um, which was one of a high profile in custody death, uh, the Public Safety Communications Department participated with that review. And what we learned is we have a responsibility within our operations of, of being part of the changing um, landscape of policing expectations and, and transferring of, of community members in need to, to different community resources. So we are poised. Um, we understand we have a responsibility to be part of that conversation and those conversations are ongoing. So how do we continue to be part of that conversation? Well, we have to be able to answer that call when it comes in. Our goal is within 10 seconds of that phone ring and that 90% of the time that we answer that call. Uh, right now we have an average of about 84%, so we have some work to do. But again, with half staff, it makes that a challenge. So what can you do? Well, we need your help. Uh, we are actively recruiting throughout the year. Uh, Mayor and Council and City Leadership has been working on a, on a, a next fiscal year budget that supports uh, and funds uh, the positions that we hold within the department to reflect the nuances and the challenges of the profession that we have. Uh, and we're well on our way on those conversations as well, as well. Better workflow transfer between emergency communication centers. One thing we wanted to take the opportunity to talk with you all about today is that we provide service, services to 11 different public safety communication uh, uh, partners. And what that means is we don't just provide services to the Tucson Police Department and the Tucson Fire Department. We actually provide medical uh, service uh, support for nine other communities in our, in our local area. And, and, and we think that's, uh, that's not well known and we're trying to spread some awareness on that. So when we make changes um, and we're out seeking community input, it's not just the city of Tucson input that, that we're seeking in the and the workflow changes that we're, we're looking to, to participate with. Increased accountability, improved service delivery um, is not just to our community, but those partners and well, as well. So we are actively participating with both Chief Magnus and uh, Chief, Chief Ryan and our community um, mental health safety partners. And as we change expectations as a community and we're tr working to shift those calls from, from our center, which we had 2,300 of those last year, which is just the tip of the iceberg. We all know, uh, again, we'll go back to the number that we reported earlier in the call with over 1.3 million calls uh, coming into the uh, Tucson uh, Public Safety Communications Department. Uh, 2,300 is not the standard that we're shooting for. So, but it creates awareness and conversations like we're having today uh, with the community of, of as we're shifting these priorities and expectations, we have to recognize that there's a lot of moving uh, complexities within these complex systems um, and it's not just the police department or, or one city or one entity driving these conversations. So now is the time for collaboration. Um, we have the right team. We have the uh, right, right people in the right seats to make some, some huge gains. I think Tucson, the city of Tucson specifically, as a native of Tucson, I'm proud to report that I think we're, we do a much better job um, than many other communities, but we do have a lot of work to do. Uh, we are hiring. Uh, we need you. We need great people. This is an, an amazing profession that you can give back. Uh, to your community and connect people in crisis with the right resources. So we appreciate your time again today. Uh, we know we're throwing out a lot of information today. It's just the beginning of an ongoing conversation. Uh, all of our contact information will be in the um, comments below. 
and we look forward to continuing these conversations with you. So with that, it's my honor to hand off over to Deputy see. City Manager, Liana Perez. It's like, I'm like trying to keep up with so much. Well, Aaron, could I ask you to just hit mute, please? Thank you, Chad. Thank you. And again, good morning, everyone. And thank you for uh, the lively uh, conversations and comments in the chat, uh, all very much appreciated. As the Deputy City Manager, I have the opportunity to work with all of the departments that you just heard from on a daily basis and seeing firsthand how the various programs and services are delivered to our community. The services and initiatives that were presented are, are quite a few of the examples of the resources that are already in place that we may need to expand upon as necessary as we develop the framework for the community safety pilot program. As Chad stated, when a member of the community calls 911, it's usually in a crisis situation or because they don't know where else to turn for help. An appropriately resourced community safety program could potentially prevent situations from escalating to a state of crisis. And in the case of non-emergencies, the community could have other resources or know how to access other resources for assistance which could have a substantial impact on the calls to 911 and how we effectively utilize our public safety resources, police and fire. As we build the framework with the continued uh, input from the community, just like we're doing here today, uh, we're evaluating the program and how we build it out in the following areas. Obviously, we're doing it in a collaborative manner, um, looking at our internal resources, uh, addressing what we have in place, our not just our community partners, but external resources that may, we may not have tapped yet to assist in a, a addressing some of these situations and uh, existing uh, service gaps. Uh, we're identifying what exists, like I just said, uh, what exists, what could, put, what could potentially be something that contributes uh, to this program. We're also looking at uh, reallocating uh, resources and restructuring those resources based on the community expectations. I know Hannah says uh, from the manager's, uh, the mayor's office rather is going to address some of those uh, uh, future uh, community listening sessions that we are going to be having. But what's important is also that we define the role uh, for police efficiencies and expectations uh, in the types of calls that they respond to. We've actually already started some of that work. Um, you, you may have seen some of the calls that are being redirected uh, to other resources that are already in place. And identifying the touch points where uh, it makes sense to uh, partner and uh, connect uh, the resources. Uh, Mayor Romero has talked about you know, connecting the, dot, the dots. We have a lot of dots to con connect uh, both large and small as we work through creating uh, the support systems that uh, we know need to exist out there. Also, uh, what will be important, obviously, as we go forward with creating this program or implementing the program rather, is the continuous community engagement. It's your community, it's our community. Uh, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, with respect to some of the uh, items that we've touched on today. We want to continuously educate the community on the resources that are out there and further train uh, the community uh, with respect to uh, use those resources. Of course, there's a lot of internal training with our staff in not just the departments that presented today, uh, but other departments uh, within the city structure as well. And then it will be important for us to uh, implement evaluation mechanisms as we move forward so that we can uh, always continuously evaluate what's working, what needs to be adjusted, uh, you know, what else can we add to the program. So now I wanna turn it over to uh, Genesis Cubillas. Uh, she is the uh, Mayor Romero's uh, Community Engagement Advisor. And I'll turn it over to Genesis. Hi everyone, just like Diana said, my name is Genesis. I'm the Community Engagement Advisor here at Mayor Regina Romero's office. Um, and first of all, I wanna thank everyone for joining us on this Saturday um, for our third installment of the Budget Town Hall series that we have. Um, and I want to remind everyone that this is only the beginning of our community efforts to engage with everyone as we move forward. Uh, and right now, especially being in budget season, 
it gives us an opportunity for us to see what kind of resources we have, what can we imagine and how we can move forward. Uh, and moving forward, I do wanna highlight a couple of things under uh, Mayor Romero's community safety program um, that we currently have. Uh, what we're looking into is expanding our independent police auditor office um, and expand and reimagine that community engagement that that office has with the community. Uh, second, we want to start shifting our resources and approach to unhoused folks into a housing first model. And I know that Liz had mentioned that before when at the beginning of COVID we were um, with COVID positive folks, we were putting them in hotel rooms and then getting them the services and resources that they need to move into permanent housing. Um, and lastly, uh, another part of the community safety program is the crucial and very important piece of hiring eight social workers that are able to respond to mental health calls and this is still something that we're trying to figure out. How is it that we can appropriately respond to these emergencies um, and giving our community the best kind of service? And just like I mentioned before, this is the beginning of our community engagement. Um, and once we start sort of building and thinking of how we want to see this community safety program, um, that's when we'll have additional town halls, additional engagement sessions with you all, and we'll let you know uh, from our office and thank you. Do I hand it back to you, Panam? I take it. Listen, thank you. I want to say thank you to Liz, Mary, Chief, Chief Magnus, Ryan, Chad, Juliana, Tennessee. So that's quite a lineup. Um, okay. Now I want to have you pull back up your mentee. And this is now you've heard a lot about a lot of extraordinary um, services. And now we're going to ask you to prioritize based on what is important to you. We're going to come back full discussion I have on my phone. but first you can go back to menti and again it's m-e-n-t-i menti.com the code to enter is 73932599 you will see the magic and genius of lane and charlene who will put up soon it's going to be soon i can tell it's coming it's like heinz ketchup yes we have that lovely little bubble it's scrolling in the meantime you can feel free to put information in here what you can think about as we get ready to move to our second question is sure. that these are just a few of the options that have been mentioned by the various uh, department directors and services that um, can be provided that maybe should be provided so please feel free um, to provide us your feedback and that is up there now so hopefully everyone can see it so what you've got are services and then like a restaurant menu the number of dollar symbols indicates size of the tab right that's the easy way to put it and so again budgeting is about trade-offs and contemplating priorities we can't afford it all or maybe we can um, maybe we choose to but consider both take your time and let's see what as a group of you know, 167 of us today, how you would prioritize these. And on this, I'm gonna say be thoughtful and take, it, take your time if you need it, you need to be time. Hello, Putnam. Oh, sure. I, don't, I don't know how to make the choice. I, I see the text, but I don't see, do I write number one or number two, or how do I write $1 sign, $2 signs? The signs are a fit. You don't have to write the dollar signs. The number of dollar signs are connected to the topic. Just right. place in order your priority. Thank you. Services. Does that make sense? 
Kind of. Thank you. Kind of. <laughs> In that case, you're welcome, kind of, for almost helping you. Almost half of us on the call have uh, responded, so that's good. And we're almost a hundred. So while you're working on it, I'm seeing a little bit in the chat about why no police or where's the police. Remember, this is a conversation about services, right? Um, so not line by line departmental review of different line items within department budgets. And so we really made an effort to simply cast the priorities relative to the services that they represent rather than specific departments or specific budgets. So it, it, it wasn't a sneaky move, it was our best attempt to take action on an intention. Um, so for what that's worth, that is what we're doing. Deborah, thank you for your feedback. That's what my children say to me all the time too. You make no sense. So already, you know, there's over 111 people, 111 have responded. There are three things that are sort of gaining some height above the others and they are create more affordable housing, expand mental health and other mental health services, and increase the number of social workers. Followed, if there was a next layer, it would be develop and expand, uh, expand the Housing First program, increase number of firefighters, keep pace with the city of Tucson's growth, and expand homeless outreach team. So keep, um, Keep responding, we're gonna keep it open so that we can see as, take your time. It's important that we give you time to be as thoughtful as feels right. But I am gonna now open up for conversation. Before we do, uh, a couple of things. Yes, we're being recorded. So every second of this is gonna be available on the City of Tucson website for you to see. When you see it, the entire chat is also there. So all of it is there so that we all get benefit 
and others that may not be here today get benefit of seeing it as well. So that's one. Two, as I've watched the chat, I am incredibly impressed um, by the intensity of engagement, by the amplitude of some of the emotion. And at moments, I get a little bit of distress that sometimes it gets almost so intense and emotional that it becomes less solution. I don't see or hear the solution. So as we migrate into open discussion, really want to hear from folks, but here it is. These are not easy, simple, bifurcated, yes or no, black or white kinds of questions. And so the thing I want to challenge us to do is there's a difference between me being right and me contributing to doing right. And so in this conversation, I really want to give my strongest encouragement to offer ideas for how to improve it, um, rather than sort of advance a position of being right. That's what I'm gonna just ask you all to do because I think it makes for, it honors the complexity of the, uh, the issue and I think it, it honors uh, each other a little bit. So let's open it up. I've seen, Sherry Jacobs, you've still got your hand up. Is that because you were, is that your mentee question or do you have something else that you wanted to offer? Sherry? Are you so taken by Menti now that you've stopped listening to us? Sherry, I wanna come back to you in case you've got something that you wanna offer. Um, in the meantime, Marlene, I see that your hand is up. Hi, Let's thank you so well. much. Welcome. Um, so one question, the independent police auditor, I had not heard of that. Is there a place on the city website that I can look more closely at that? And another comment as we're talking about the budgeting um, and the different services, is there a place that's easy to look at where the current budgets lie to see how much the different services are currently being appropriated? I love your curiosity. Um, Chief, you wanna answer that or anyone else? I can answer the question about the independent police auditor. It, uh, it is a office that is resides out of the city manager's office. The independent police auditor reports directly to the city manager. We can put the link uh, to the auditor's office in the uh, chat. It is online. Um, with respect to the dollar uh, question, I will need to defer that. <laughs> the other half of your question. Are all the departmental budgets available or accessible online somewhere? And if so, where? I suspect they are, because you're so transparent. Where would I go? Anybody? Jeff Yates. Uh, those are available at tucsonaz.gov. And there is a budget document that has all of our funding and the breakout. And we will be producing new materials coming out in the next uh, couple of months related to the recommended budget as we continue on in our budget process. We are not to the point in the 2022 budget process where we have the detail available to the public at this point. Um, we're still having high level policy discussions with the council, but as we progress through the recommended budget and into the final adopted budget, that information will be available. Super. Thank you, Jeff. Marlene, I hope that answered both of your questions. And thank you for both great questions. Barbara, I'm going to come to you. After that, Michael, I'll swing by you. So go ahead, Barbara. Welcome. What's your question or comment? Barbara Warren. Okay. There you oh, are. There I am. Um, Congressman Grijalva just introduced a bill, uh, the Asuncion Valadez uh, Outdoor Worker Heat Protection Bill in Congress, and it's also been introduced into our uh, Senate, our, not our Senate, but the National Senate. I would like to know what we're going to do for the upcoming extreme heat that's com that comes every year to mandate our employers to protect all outdoor workers from extreme heat. And there are a lot of measures that can be taken. I, I know that the mayor would like to have this in a climate adaptation plan, but I think that's too long to wait. I think we need to deal with this now because it's getting hotter. And, and, it, and I think it needs to be a lot more than just having them work in the middle of the night because most, most employees cannot work in the middle of the night or the companies don't work that way. So I'm wondering how we're going to address extreme heat protection for outdoor workers and homeless people and anyone else that's required to be outside all the time. Thank you for that question, Barbara. Anyone who would like to take that from the city? Poonam, I can take that. 
Um, yes, Barbara, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We, we have received this question from you before and, and we, we've uh, talked about it during the climate adaptation town hall as well. Uh, we're in the process of uh, moving the climate action and adaptation plan forward, as well as looking at evaluating what immediate movements we need to make um, for extreme heat here in the city of Tucson to help protect seniors and children and outside workers as well. Thank you, Mayor Romero. Thank you for the question, Barbara. Michael, coming to you after that. Daniel, I'll be at your door. Take it, Michael. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, my, uh, I work for a federal agency here in town. Um, I can't say which one because I can't represent them. Obviously, I'm not their information officer, but I work with the TPD on a regular basis and uh, find them to be extremely professional, very hardworking uh, individual officers and detectives. I also can testify firsthand that they're severely underfunded. Their equipment is old. Um, and a lot, of, I, as we all know, a lot of their officers are leaving to go to other areas. Uh, where they had better pay, um, better equipment. I guess my next qu my question would be, it, does TPD have an existing um, PERT team or psychological intervention team? Other, other, other areas and agencies have a what's called a PERT or psychological emergency response team where it's an officer or a deputy and they ride with a, psych, uh, a um, mental health professional. Usually it's uh, uh, someone, a nurse practitioner or someone of that, uh, of that ilk that responds with the officer to a call where there's a need for psychological intervention. I, and I'll, uh, I'll meet myself now. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Who would like to take that? Chief, Chief Magnus. Magnus. Got your name all over it, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, we are very fortunate in Tucson that we have uh, crisis mobile teams. There are a dozen of them. They're funded by Arizona Complete Health. That's through your Medicaid expansion dollars. It's separate from the city, but they work very closely with our department. People can actually call them directly through the crisis line and have them respond um, to mental health situations. But they often utilize us as well because some situations are just too dangerous for their crisis folks to go into by themselves. And so they'll either wait for the police or ask us to respond with them. But they're available now about 18 hours a day we're looking at, is there a way to get more of them um, so that there's 24 seven coverage. Um, and then the other factor is we have our MIST team, our mental health services team, which are a group of about 13 personnel in the department that have specialized mental health training. And they go out proactively to deal with higher risk mental health situations. Um, this was sort of an outgrowth of um, the Gabby Gifford shooting where people thought if the individual involved in that situation could have been contacted earlier, there were a lot of signs he had problems, then that might have been averted. And so that's one of the things our MIS team does among others. So a lot of work being done around mental health, uh, always more need. And that's why the mayor's proposal for the eight additional social workers is super important because we could absolutely utilize them in the field and would love to have that resource. Very good, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Michael, thank you, Chief. Um, just responding quickly to some of the discussion in the chat, just want you to be aware um, that for those that are feeling let down by the menu of services that were available to you to respond to, not by design, I promise it is not by design. Part of the challenge of going where you've never gone and doing what you've never done is you don't know what you're supposed to know. So on early next week, you will get an email that will allow you yet another opportunity to offer additional ideas, additional suggestions. So uh, again, if you are feeling like the list is limiting, that's not by design, I promise. And early next week, there'll be an email that will allow you to give us all of the other things that should have been there so that we will be smarter for next time. Um, all right, Daniel, coming to you after that. Anthony, I'm gonna stop by your front door. Take it, Anthony. Thanks for your patience, sir. I would like to- oh, Daniel, I'm sorry, Daniel, go. I would like to thank Mayor Romero. I don't think there's a person in this country who's done a better job at protecting us during this COVID uh, problem. She has been excellent and probably the best person in the state of Arizona. But I have another question that should go to her and maybe the whole panel, but one thing will eventually go to her. I noticed that there is a column that we've seen that says to, increase the fire department and to do it. very important. But 
but is it your is it your goal to defund the police to keep their numbers down and to keep their pay low or have you other ulterior motives in us not seeing anything regarding the police department i get a sense that you are anti police and do not care about the city of of tucson as a whole in this respect thank you and this question is for for me daniel yes Okay, well, um, first and foremost, thank you so much. I really appreciate you all showing up. Um, and no, I do not believe in defunding the police. I actually believe in funding. Um, and I've been looking at the chat and the conversations um, online. And I believe that as Chief Magnus has said, we need to work on investing in prevention strategies in the city of Tucson, making sure that we have, that we're funding uh, mental health uh, services as well as um, uh, addiction services and other homelessness and helping with sheltering the homeless communities in Tucson. And that's why we're creating the community safety pilot program so that we can connect all of the services that have to do with public safety that includes police fire and all of the support services like housing community development our court system as well as um, hiring new social workers and a housing first director so no I, I don't believe in that I believe in investing more as a matter of fact um, to make sure that we're we have a, a first and foremost a healthy city a safe city and um, our workers, which include police and firefighters, uh, should be able to have a decent work environment, the necessary equipment for them to be kept safe and paid well, um, as well as investing in other diversion programs and investments in community to help prevent um, and anti-poverty programs as well. So it should be holistic. Um, that's the reason why we created this town hall the way we did. And as Poonam has said, uh, the services provided, the questions that were provided um, for you all to answer uh, came from the departments that presented today. And so um, nothing was uh, left out intentionally, uh, but we do wanna hear from you and we wanna hear um, the suggestions that you have to make and uh, your input, your advice to mayor and council. Um, yeah, and hopefully I answered your question, Mr. Russo. No, you didn't. Uh, you, I asked specifically about whether you were, were going to increase the police department and increase their pay and, and not talk about all these other things of people that don't show up in the middle of the night when there's a homicide or there's a theft in my neighborhood. You've completely ignored that. And I would like you to respond to that directly. I believe in paying our police officers uh, decent wages comparable to the wages of other cities surrounding us and the Valley cities. And so um, I believe in making sure that we pay our officers um, comparable wages to other cities. So, um, I don't know if, if that's an answer for you. And I believe in, and I believe, I also believe in making sure that all of our city workers and city employees are paid well. Um, that's something that um, mayor and council have to, um, have to be able to listen to the community on. And that's why we're having these conversations. Daniel, thank you for the question. Um, Romero, thank you for the response. Anthony, I am coming to you. Thanks for being such a patient man. Welcome, Mr. Hanson. Unmute. Oh, yeah. Uh, following up with what Daniel was saying, um, I, I talk to police officers when I see them, quick trip and whatnot, and try to get an idea. And from what I understand is um, Tucson police is kind of a stepping stone to get in, get educated in the police department. And as soon as they get their uh, chops or whatever, they end up going to Marana, Green Valley, wherever's paying higher. So I don't believe that you're paying police officers uh, a wage that's com comparable. If not, we wouldn't have 80 plus police officers leaving 
and, and I don't know, 20 recruits coming in. And I don't see any advertising anywhere on, on billboards for, for recruit or retention of uh, police officers in, in Tucson now. Right. So yeah. where, are we going to allocate any funds to, to try to retain them and, and keep them from using us as a stepping stone platform? Anthony, thank you for that perspective and the observation. And I think we all heard you. I didn't hear a question there. Um, thank you. Are we going to allocate funds for more retention and, and keeping police officers here and not, not use Tucson as a stepping stone to go to other agencies? So here's the su suggestion I would make is that that budget will be presented late spring and it'll have specific recommendations in there. If what you're offering is that that for you would be a priority. It wasn't one of the options that was listed today. When you get the email, offer that as, as a resident, this is what matters to you so that it can be potentially baked into that process. That seem fair? Because right now there's, there's no approved budget, right? Okay. I'm just curious on, on if we're going to even allocate anything to, to hire pay for police officers. I think it's very important. Chief Megan, thank you. contemplating that. Thank Mayor, you. Mayor Poonam, this is, uh, this is Michael. Maybe I can, I can add uh, oh. and maybe give you some clarity if that's okay, Poonam. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just. Yeah, let, let the big boss take over. Go yeah, for it. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm Michael Ortega. I'm the city manager, and I'm the one that actually makes the recommendation for the budget to the mayor and council. So Anthony, your question, uh, I'll answer very directly. The answer is yes. Uh, but keep in mind, that's my recommendation based on the, all the priorities that we have across the board. My direction from the council has been clear. They want to address the issue in a holistic manner. It's not just about police. This is not about funding police or not funding police. This is addressing all of the needs that we have as a community. I think uh, the mayor's leadership has been demonstrated by soliciting feedback about community safety on a macro scale. Uh, that's where we want to keep it. I can tell you that my recommended budget will include adjustments for salaries. Um, is it going to do everything that, that uh, might be wanted by every group? No. Um, but my expectation is that on April 6th, I will give the council some options to consider for the 22 year. Uh, and that will include adjustments for salaries, particularly in the, in the public safety realm. Uh, so okay. Thank you for the opportunity thank you. to address that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Ortega, appreciate that. Thank you, Anthony. Jose, you thank next, you. and then after that, Tony, I'll come to you. Hello, um, everyone. Um, Welcome. I, thank you. Um, so I'll try to be, um, Competent in this question or comment. Um, I have a few. I have a few observations, if I may. Um, I'm just yeah, I'm fast. Okay. Um, so, you know, I see this uh, big plurality in terms of defunding the police, and then another line where it's like we need more police. Um, and I heard the conversation in terms of uh, Tucson being a stepping stone. Um, so I'm originally from Tucson. I'm from Chicago, and I could tell you any urban community is a stepping stone to get out to whatever better community or whatever. That doesn't necessarily mean um, continuing to increase and increase and increase. Now, if there's need, I can appreciate that. I appreciate uh, what the individual police officers are doing. I also appreciate those who are looking at it as an institution and it sort of um, can be out of control. And I'll tell you right now, one, one big observation, and I made this earlier, I've been jotting it down, the um, presentation in terms of TPD um, really was um, turned me off completely. I, I, I attended this as an open in an open mind to see what's going on and what are the possible solutions. But if they're focused on one particular community, on one particular demographic, you know, the black community in uh, Midtown or Campbell, and, and and using that as a focus to sort of um, improve you know like this is why we need more there I, I would like to know what um you know like in, in other words the fire department printed and they presented themselves and this is what we're doing this is what we're, the communities we're affecting in the, as a whole and then the chats i'm hearing a lot of people like well you don't know you don't live in the city and i'm like i do live in the city i do live in an area that i want to just i'm sorry we're just down to the wire i just want to give you a pencil sharpener we're okay okay um so uh, you know, again, my concern is that we hear each other, 
that this is you you asked that there be solutions but i see that there's a big plurality happening and i think that's the worst thing that could happen in tucson tucson's a great community we should really look at that thank you that's great thank you jose um tony i'm going to come to you we've got literally one minute left and there's and Dwight, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to cut it off just because we flat run out of time. It's the only reason. So Tony, you get the last question. Okay, um, Mayor, good to see you again. I remember speaking to you when you were a candidate and one of the things that you definitely promised was that you would actually have boards and committees where people from the community could actually you know, engage with different city officials. Um, pretty much got tired of waiting. So we pretty much created one ourselves over the past year, we've actually been having conversations with the police. And one of the things that we found out is uh, pay is only one of the situations that are really one of the challenges police are facing here. Um, it's also, it also has a lot to do with the environment that they work in. And one of the, one of the things that I found out by talking to people in the community that the top-down approach that the city council has been taking as far as unemployable people, unemployable, I mean, by dropouts, you know, people with records and things like that, there's been absolutely no real focus on people like that. And those are the actual people who are driving crime here. So what I really wanted to know is, what are you guys gonna do to, in order to give more people opportunity? People, not just people, you know, graduates and things of that nature, but people who can't get jobs anywhere else. Tony, that, thank you for that. That I feel like now I want to take you out for dinner and open a bottle of wine because that's how substantive the, the question is that you just posed. Um, there's been a lot of theme in the chat. And let me also observe, it is the million dollar question that every community in the country is going to answer. And that is what is this delicate balance between being responsive to the problems and preventing problems in the first place? It is a very complicated set of issues. And I think as of now, this is the third um, town or budget town hall that we've had. And just as an outside perspective, I think there's a ton of effort being placed by the, the team at the city of Tucson to try to really figure out how to invest to prevent and be responsive in all of the services that the city offers. So I know that's not a, a it doesn't answer it for you, um, but we've run out of time. <laughs> so that's bummer. Um, all right, we've got literally negative one minute left. I just wanna wrap it up again. Suggestions, additional ideas, additional input, please, it is, really uh, earnestly desired by the city. There will be an email you'll receive, I think it's probably gonna be Monday or Tuesday, allowing you that opportunity to express some more. Please do it. For those of you that are concerned that this is gonna be the conversation that will dictate all the budget, that is not what it is. Budget process underway, town halls newly introduced into the process this year to engage and create particip uh, participatory budgeting over time. The idea is to get more and more participatory so that we end up with a budgeting process that contemplates the priorities of citizens. So there isn't going to be any you know, changes, massive changes based on this conversation today. So I just want to make that clear too. Mark your calendar. The last of four of these budget town halls will happen on Thursday, April 9th, uh, 5.30 p.m. The focus that day will be on resilience recovery. Looking forward. Um, at the beginning, the mayor really, I think, beautifully set us off on a journey that was uh, triggered with gratitude. And I wanna punctuate that with gratitude as well. Uh, however you feel, whatever you feel, here is what I hope we can all agree on. Mayor Romero, City Council, City Manager Otega, City staff, thank you for authentic commitment to contemporizing the budgeting process, including us as collaborators. It essentially spotlights the public in public service, and we appreciate that. So I wanna say thank you. It is not the norm with governments and municipal governments all over the country, it is your norm. And so I'm really uh, good for you, is what I would say. To all of you who took 90 minutes, 90 minutes out of a gorgeous Saturday with a whole bunch of competing priorities, thank you. Your ideas, they matter. Your input's important, your passion is critical, and your choice to be here demonstrates just how deeply you care about the future of this community. That is a big deal, my friends. And I wanna, if I had a hat on, I would tip my hat to you. 
Um, so finally, I think the person who starts us off with the conductor's baton should be the one who gets the last word. So take us out, Mira Romero. Thank you, Punam, and thank you to all the department directors that presented, to all the people that are here with us today. Um, your input, your feedback, your advice as to the betterment uh, and the investment uh, into our community is important to us. Like Poonam said, this is not the last word. You all have the opportunity uh, to continue communicating with mayor and council. We will email you so that you can do a much more thorough um, um, input into what you all want to see the mayor and council invest in. And the point of this particular town hall was to talk about community safety uh, from and all of the services that provide safety to our community and what it means to all of us. So in looking at community safety, we, we did look at the departments holistically that provide that safety to all of us. Um, again, thank you all for your questions. Um, it's not the last time that you will have to give input to mayor and council. We will continue um, getting your uh, emails and calls and hopefully you, you fill out that, uh, that survey. So thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. This is not uh, the end of the conversation. I appreciate you all and uh, have a great weekend and we'll be seeing you all soon. Thank you to the department directors, to Poonam for doing uh, such wonderful facilitation uh, to the city manager and uh, all my staff and all of you that came. Thank you, have a great day. And if you don't mind, um, Madam Mayor, I'd love to just give the group the last word. Go into the chat, you got one word. Stick in your one word, here's the question you're gonna answer. What is the one commitment, like a pinky promise that you're gonna make to your fellow residents of Tucson. What is that one commitment that you're gonna make? Defund, okay. <laughs> Giving back, engage, serve, be a voice for barrios, support, listen. It's awesome, vote, good, that's awesome. Thank you all, happy Saturday. Do something really, really loving for yourself.